We here with uh, David Suisa, the famous uh, leader of this uh, Jewish community for years and years. It's the second time we meet. Yes, and I'm glad to be here. Every time after a movie, uh, I get a chance to hear a joke from you, something funny, doing the questioning and the stuff. Today you didn't disappoint me neither. Well, yeah, you know, this is an incredible movie called The Dolphin Boy. And as I was watching the movie, I was thinking, wow, it would be great if the the peace negotiators would come to that place in Elat and swim with the dolphins. Maybe it would add a little bit of innocence to the whole peace process and we can make some progress. Thanks. Because the human beings have not accomplished much. So maybe the dolphins can help bring peace to the Middle East. You love stuff that's coming from Israel, right? I think Israel is the most miraculous country in the world by far. Nothing comes close. And I'm not a blind sort of supporter that doesn't know all the faults of Israel. Uh, when I look at the whole picture of Israel, there is a, a miraculous aspect to Israel in terms of the creativity of the people and the stuff that's coming out of Israel now, not just the high-tech accomplishments, but the creativity and the, the films and the music. And I'm not sure exactly where all this comes from. It could be that you have all this blend of different nationalities, the Mizrahis, the Ethiopians, the Sephardic, the Ashkenazim, the Haredi, there's just some incredible explosion of cultural uh, flavors that we just don't see anywhere else in the world. And it makes me even more proud to be, to be Jewish and to be in love with Israel. I remember you have a family in Israel. I do. I do. Most of my family went to fight in the war of 1948, my mother's family. And uh, we settled in Ashkelon in the beginning. So I was, I was one of those Moroccan Sephardic. And now there's a few hundred of them all over the, uh, the country, including in Elat. And, you know, I'm really proud to have a family there. The, the story in our family was when my grandfather first landed in Israel. He kissed the ground and said, I'm never leaving. So I was raised with that story. My grandfather kissed the ground of Israel and said, I'm never leaving. And he never left. Well, even though you were a great leader here in, uh, in America and you support the Jewish community, there is any chance we convince you to come and make Aliyah to Israel? <laughs> you know how many times I, I bought a house in Ashkelon, I, I looked at homes in Israel, I came close to buying a home in, in Jerusalem two summers ago. I go there at least once, twice a year, um, and I can't tell you how many times I came this close. But I have five children. One of my kids, by the way, is now studying at IDC in Herzliya. But I find that um, you know I'm helping Israel so much from here that a lot of people are telling me I'm doing a lot more for Israel out of uh, America. So, but we're, we. Every, every Jew in his heart that I know wants to feel like going back to live in Israel. It's part of being Jewish. So tell me about um, the next project. The next project I'm thinking of is to uh, position Israel as the key to the, to the Middle East. Um, that even though the whole world thinks that Israel is the curse in the Middle East and the enemy of the Middle East, I'd like the world to see Israel as the cure to the Middle East. All the lessons that we have learned over the past 65 years are lessons that the rest of the Middle East can take advantage of, dealing with the desert, uh, world it, from terms of technology, the combination of church and state, socially, culturally, education-wise, dealing with minorities, all these complicated problems, Israel has been dealing with them. And the rest of the Middle East now needs to learn the lessons from Israel. So my dream and the project I'm working on is to make the world see that Israel is really the place that can save the Middle East. Okay, I'm going to vote for you if you want to be <laughs> the next Benjamin Netanyahu. I love you. <laughs> Yeah. But I trust you. This is the reason I'm going to ask you a deep question. There we, I interview more than 200 people in my life, but I have a common question, two common questions that I ask. What's the best thing happened to you ever? My children. Besides children, it was the day I started writing a column because my life got transformed. Um, I was in the advertising business for 25 years, and then they asked me to write a column. I just did it as a joke, and then it's now been six years. I have not missed one week. I've been writing a weekly column for the past six years, and I have this huge audience that waits for my column every week, and that's been a transformative aspect of my life, just this 
this idea of having an audience. Okay, now I believe you. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, before I'm going to ask you the, the second question that I ask everyone, I wanted to ask you, working with a lot of people in audience during those years, uh, tell me the most remarkable reaction that you got from a person. Uh, the most remarkable reaction I ever got was a column I wrote a year ago. It was called Israel Never Looks So Good. And it came right after the Tahrir Square uh, demonstrations. I have never come close to getting a reaction on one article. I got over a thousand emails from around the world, Israeli embassies. It went on Huffington Post, and you can even see it. It's called Israel Never Looks So Good. There's nothing I've done since then or before that got a reaction. It was just, I, I think I waited 30 years for, to write that column because it was right in the middle of the whole balagan in Egypt. And I finally said, now the whole world could see that uh, this is not about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what the Arabs are screaming for in the streets of the Middle East is exactly what the Arabs get in Israel. They're screaming for the freedoms that they can get in Israel. And I thought it was my moment, my opportunity, and I did it and got a great reaction. I'm hoping one day I'll have another one. <laughs> I hope you're going to have even more audience. In some way, you have a story and you have an opinion and you want to say something. Yeah. You know, I'm making film too, so I know I have a story, I have, I have a, a message that I want right. to give, and I'm doing that. Correct. One of the deepest human needs is to be heard. You know, it's not enough to have an idea or a thought. We want to be heard, whether it's in a loving relationship, in a husband and wife situation, whether it's with your children or your friends or your colleagues or the world. There's a great deep human need to be heard. And when you do have a story and you are heard, it's just an incredible combination. Okay, I'm going to give you the next question. What's uh, your dream? You have a dream, a goal in your life? You know, I always say I'm going to fight for Israel until my last breath. That's sort of uh, my dream. But I, this, the, the, this vision I have of helping to position Israel as a, uh, as a real uh, light unto the Middle East, I think is, is one of the great dreams I have. I mean, besides my family and, you know, Besides personal stuff, in terms of Israel, it's my dream. David Twisa, I wanted to thank you for this interview. Oh. And thank you for... My so it's my, anything I can do for Israel warms my heart. It's my great honor to, to help Israel, really. I feel privileged to be a Jew, and I feel privileged to be connected in such a deep way to Israel. Thank you, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you so See much. See you soon, I hope. All right, and hello to my family in Israel, yes. if you're watching.